everybody. Welcome to Union Public Library and Dr. Walter Gleason. We, none of us would be here tonight if it wasn't for the Union Historical Society, the Union County Historical Society, and the Hall Historical Society. And I want to thank them for co promoting this program, co-sponsoring it, and being so great. Um, I'm going to give a very short introduction. Um, but I just want to say, if you're interested in learning more about programs, for instance, we have um, the history of Negro baseball, we have um, a program on costumes from a Broadway designer and an opera designer, then put your email in the um, chat box, look it up on Facebook, or check our website. Um, so Dr. Friesen has so many uh, qualifications that I'm only going to list one of them, which is to say he's with Monmouth University. But in, if you go to his website, you'll see about his six books and all the other things that he's done. So it is, gives me great pleasure to present Dr. Walter Greeson, who I'm very grateful you're here tonight. Dr. Greeson? Thank you so much. It's a joy to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. Um, so much of my work takes me around the country in different, different places in the world, and my favorite work is always talking to folks in New Jersey. Um, it's just, it always amazed me when I started to become a historian how little was written about the place and, and going from library to library and figuring out kind of what stories could be told. It, it just, doing this tonight is a joy and I'm so glad to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Walter Grayson. I am a professor of education at Monmouth University. Most of the time these days, I focus on training uh, principals and superintendents people who are taking over leadership in our school districts. And it's joyful work, even during COVID, um, that folks still want to connect, want to inspire young people. But I started my career as a historian and I, I had the rare treat of talking about my favorite subject is New Jersey history. And, and it's, it's always amazing to me how little this happens. Um, we have lots of requirements in our public schools and in our universities to teach New Jersey history. But um, still, most of the folks who live here have, have never come across the content. And so in, in this particular case, I'm building on a couple of colleagues' works to talk in, in more detail about Union County in particular, but there are broader patterns to start to tap into. And so I, I want to give a little bit of background about how I came to all of this and then get into the meat and potatoes, the, the nitty gritty of, of the night and, and focusing on the different towns and their relationship to each other and how that's changed over time. So to start, uh, I was born in uh, Freehold, New Jersey, uh, a few miles south of where, where we're focused this evening. And um, in Freehold, I, I grew up and, and I eventually moved to Manalapan and, and, and went off to Philadelphia for all my, my education. And it was in the course of getting my graduate degree that I, my parents got into a terrible car accident. And so I was faced with the choice of, do I kind of trust that other folks will look out for them as they recover? And I go about my studies and I was studying South Africa at that point. So I would be very far away. Or do I change my topic and start to focus on New Jersey in some way and find something worth writing about that uh, people hadn't discussed before. And so of course I chose the latter. I, I wanted to do something that was gonna let me stay with my parents and, and continue my work towards my degree. And what I ended up discussing was the way my area had, had really transformed along routes 33 and route nine, that what were farming villages with dirt roads and stop signs had become these massive arteries of huge amounts of traffic with uh, strip malls and a regional mall at Raceway. And I didn't understand how that could have happened in, in a relatively short period of time in less than a decade. And so I spent almost 15 years tracing the patterns of how those communities evolved up until 1950. And then once I got to that point, digging into financial and real estate records and figuring out how the suburbs formed in New Jersey um, in the second half of the 20th century. And so to do that, what I immediately came across 
was the fact that when folks write New Jersey history, at least in the last 20 to 30 years, they were focusing on the major cities. Um, even though there is no Chicago in New Jersey, there's, there's nothing to sco scope and scale of New York City. Um, almost everything on New Jersey kind of centers on Newark. And then to a lesser extent, you had newer books on Camden and Atlantic City. Um, there still isn't a really single great book on Trenton to be done at this point. And so it was these focus on cities that I was like, okay, it's clear folks are, are interested in these urban centers and the process of industrialization and how that changed the nature of the state that ironically the garden state became really prosperous with its manufacturing industries through the mid 19th century and early 20th century. And so that was, that was one story. But because I knew I was coming at this question of suburbs and because I knew the nature of the state of New Jersey at that point was there were these hundreds of suburban com communities growing over the last 50, 60 years of the 20th century. I said, we've got to unpack that process. We've got to figure out how that is unfolding. And it was the template that I uncovered there that ultimately led to uh, my first two books, The Path to Freedom and Suburban Erasure. And Suburban Erasure is, is much more relevant to what we're doing tonight. It basically shows that instead of seeing suburbs as at the edges of larger industrial centers, where there's a downtown city, and then eventually people move out to the fringes of the city, I flipped the map of analysis where I looked at suburbs as infringing on the countryside, that there were rural towns and small communities where vast farms were that had kind of defined New Jersey, and that those places were shrinking as a result of the expansion of the suburbs. And so that's the major contribution uh, my first two books made was documenting African American history in these small towns, and then documenting the process of how suburbs just completely changed that landscape. It wasn't as many sociologists and other scholars described it, chocolate cities surrounded by vanilla suburbs, but there was this mosaic of multi-ethnic communities spreading out from the industrial centers and changing the landscape of the rural farming areas. And, and that's what I wanted to try and put in the context. I did not talk explicitly about Union County in, in the books, but um, I did that because there was a lot of work related to Newark and Elizabeth that had been done that really spoke to Union County. So tonight was my chance to come back and basically connect the framework that I created to the understanding of how people have analyzed Union County. So that's the long introduction. Um, <laughs> To get deeper into this, and this will probably take about 30 minutes to walk, walk through what, what I see. Um, and then I, I'm counting on all of you, um, however long you've been residents of the county, to share stories and questions that either fit or don't fit what I'm about to say. Um, the complexity of what you all have to offer as individual stories is always gonna be more detailed than what we can document in the historical record. I, I used to teach a lesson just on the nature of history. And um, I would draw a big circle on the, on the board and say, that's everything that ever happened in the past. Everything that happened before now is that circle. And then I would draw about a third of the circle. I'd cut it away and say, that third of the circle is what we remember. All the records, all the documents, all the things that we have that let us think that we learned something about what happened before that's about a third. We have about a third of everything that happened that we know, or at least we can find documents related to it. There's little tiny sliver. That's like 1% of the circle is what we call history. It's that somebody professionally goes out and gathers documents related to what happened before. They try to fit them together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And then they decide to kind of tell the story of what pieces of evidence they're sharing with you. So that's the difficulty, is that we don't have a really new history. And if you know any students in college or graduate school who would like to do it, um, I would love, love to support them. 
But that's what this tonight is an exercise in. And it's built on two, two colleagues' works. Uh, Paul Mattingly has done some extraordinary stuff around Elizabeth that tell us stories about kind of the second half of the 20th century, particularly in Eastern <coughs> Union County. But then a better framework for kind of understanding the region comes out of uh, Tom Segrew's work, um, especially around Plainfield. And it gives us a, a very dissonant image from what Mattingly put together. But those two stories, and, and I'll stop on them for just a minute. Um, Mattingly is another suburban historian. <clears throat> Segrew is more of the, he is the leading urban historian in the United States. But um, they both have these really keen insights about documents and resources that have survived. But they focus in on Union County in ways that tell us about the rest of the country. And so <clears throat> they're more concerned, they're certainly concerned with the details of the particular places they focus on, whether it's Elizabeth or whether it's Plainfield. But putting all those pieces together, that's more of what I'm doing tonight is to look at the other communities in the county. And so I'm gonna kind of walk through um, the general parameters of what Sabru and Mattingly show us. And then from there, start to fill in the blanks of what I do which is a lot about economic development. It's about patterns of wealth accumulation, patterns of uh, both industrial um, business enterprises, as well as um, public infrastructure. And um, I admitted somebody and I lost my train of thought. Um, industrial enterprises, uh, public infrastructure, and ultimately um, connections to the global economy, places where our service economy emerges after 1970 in Union County. So that's what I'm gonna walk through for the next few minutes. All right, Let's see if I can share my image here. Looks like it'll work. So this is basic image just to show what everybody already knows and is familiar with, but I'm also kind of stunned. Um, when I do this with students, they almost never look at their counties. Um, that is, they have some rough idea of what the United States map looks like. In, in rare cases, they might have some idea of what their uh, municipal, their, their hometown map may look like. But very rarely do they look at counties and how kind of neighboring communities and how they all fit together into a unit of governance. Maybe I can make it a little bit bigger. I'm looking at folks putting on glasses and things. So let's see what I can do. Um, and hopefully that's a little better. Oh, my goodness, that shouldn't have happened. All right, so as you would expect, the story really starts here in Elizabeth in, in the founding of New Jersey, the original capital, um, and that this as the center of the county, um, even though it's on the eastern edge, um, this is the start of the story of Union County's growth, is that the formation of Elizabeth, it's um, kind of splitting away from Essex County and, and Newark, and tensions really against Essex County. Um, frames the initial idea of political power in the region, and also the idea that the um, merchant economy, the financial infrastructure that comes from um, the naval trade, is what sets the table for the early residences, the way people begin to build churches, uh, small businesses that get created through the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, Elizabeth is really the heart of the story. But for me, most of this that we're gonna to do tonight is much more of a 20th century story. And so you see the emergence of Linden and Rahway, um, eventually Roselle Park, Roselle, um, some early suburbanization into Hillside and Union. All of this kind of extended region, even into the kind of Eastern portions of Cranford. Um, this is a product of not just demographic growth, between the late 19th and early 20th century, but um, massive waves of immigration. And so that process of immigrants coming from 
um, Italy, from Eastern Europe, uh, large numbers of Jewish immigrants coming in this period. Um, this is what's fueling growth in these portions of Union County and transforming what it, what it means to be uh, not just an American, but to be, be successful in New Jersey. It's one of my favorite stories of this era is of um, entrepreneurship and small business creation. That people who come with virtually nothing are starting bakeries, they're starting textile shops, um, cigarettes, cigarette and cigar um, student shops are opening up. And that's what's powering kind of neighborhood business. Um, underwritten by local banks, in some cases, state level banks. But that's what's making this, this early development, um, pre-1930 development really take hold. But that's also enabling commuter rail lines to start to spread out through the Western portions of the state. And you also have folks connecting rails up through, through kind of through these uh, Southwestern municipalities as well. And so the rail line set the template for what eventually will be the, uh, the uh, county roads and eventually what, what comes to be the uh, Garden State Parkway and the um, New Jersey Turnpike. But all of this is predicated on the wealth that's being generated out of these regions. And so what starts to happen after the Second World War, and it's really important, the, the, the hugest event that no one really talks about outside of historians is the 1947 uh, New Jersey State Constitution. And most of the time when I talk about the state constitution, I use it in the context of race relations and that the Article I non-discrimination protections um, allow African-Americans to serve on jur juries, to be part of the National Guard, to essentially claim citizenship explicitly in ways that were not protected by the 1881 state constitution. And so the 1947 constitution does some profound things for African-Americans so that they can get increasing residence in Elizabeth, in Linden, um, in Plainfield, um, even into places like, like Scotch Plains. Um, that shift is much more important for the children of the immigrant and the grandchildren of the immigrant populations that had come into Eastern Union County. The state constitution in 1947 has a profound social effect on the children of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. That essentially they're able to lay claim to the American dream in ways that their parents and their grandparents couldn't, where ethnic neighborhoods really defined their experience the opening up of the suburbs in uh, Union and Kenilworth and Springfield and Summit and Westfield, these things and Clark as, as well, these communities start to open up to immigrant families or the, the grandchildren of immigrant families that are now increasingly identifying as white Americans, which wasn't possible 30, 40, 50 years earlier, that being a Catholic disqualified someone from being white. Being Jewish disqualified someone from being white. The 1947 Constitution that protected against discrimination opened the door to saying that was not permissible. That if someone came from a particular ethnic background, they could actually belong, not just as a citizen in a colorblind way, but that they could become part of, of the white population of the United States. And so this was striking as the county became more populous, as more and more suburbs formed through the 1950s and 1960s. You get harder and harder racially divided lines in these communities, and it's, it's quite striking. Um, probably the single biggest example that I do write about in Suburban Erasure is about the penitentiary and, and the community surrounding it in Rahway, is that the places along this eastern portion of the county um, become much more diverse, typically more working class. Um, the role of both local government and state government and federal government becomes increasingly important. It's less about private sector industry and, and large corporate growth that had identified these communities in the first half of the 20th century. The transition is really sharp and, and even in the late 20th century begins to shape Plainfield in, in similar ways. But you also have subtle kind of variations where hillside tends to be slightly more affluent 
in terms of new immigrants and African Americans. Scotch Plains has populations of African Americans and, and new immigrants that are tend to be more middle class. And so it's not strictly racial segregation in the way people imagine it in the 1960s with Bull Connor and white and black signs, although there were places that were aggressive about racial segregation in New Jersey. But this was much more about social class. It was about kind of community belonging, comfort about neighborhood. A number of scholars have done work, uh, not just in New Jersey, but nationwide, especially out in Michigan, I would say is where you see a lot of this data, where um, homeowners associations actively no longer kind of keep people out based on ethnicity or religion, but they keep people out saying that some populations create a decline in property values, that it makes an area less desirable if it is um, more heterogeneous, if it's, if it's more mixed, that it's more difficult to sell residential property. And so those are the dynamics that are playing out across Union County through the second half of the 20th century. You, you get to these places where, you know, um, Plainfields is 50% African-American, I think another like 30 or 40% um, non-Hispanic, um, non-white. And so just massive numbers where you see um, Summit or Mountainside or even Clark remain over 90% white. And so those ethnic divisions are morphing and changing over time in really interesting ways in Union County. And so that sets the story for really the last 20 or 25 years, that since the mid 1990s, when the kind of world that we live in today is taking shape. Um, I believe it's Winfield as the question from Maya is um, down there. And then the Garwood is here, if folks can't see it. Um, and so this process of how we imagine a melting pot that defines the United States is much more complex. And it's uniquely important to study it in, in Union County because it tells us a lot about what may happen over the next 20 or 30 years for the whole country as there becomes no majority population. That the increased blending of groups, people crossing lines and new communities forming this is a blueprint to see what has happened in the last 20 years in Union County, but also to forecast the next generation of Americans and how in different places that are, that are shaped different, that have entirely different histories, are going to replicate some of the patterns of what has been happening here. And so that's what I really wanna focus on for the next kind of sizable chunk. And then we can have a lot of questions and explore and, and talk about our personal experiences living in the county. Um, when Mattingly talks about a man named um, Stephen Sampson, he, he crafts this amazing story of uh, migration north as part of the Great Migration and then um, defiance, not accepting segregation and pressing to organize so that local officials start to tear down the barriers, especially in employment, that there can be an African-American plumber, it can be an African-American electrician, that there can be professionals who are African-American in Union County. And he's really focused on Elizabeth. And if he wins the fights in Elizabeth, it, it's gonna set the tone for the remainder of the county. But in focusing on Samson, and this is a very seductive kind of uh, pressure for historians, we can also obscure the level of the struggle in all the other communities around the county to break down those same barriers. Um, for children to attend integrated schools, um, how private schools can form to kind of maintain some degree of elitism or separation. Um, those stories don't get told very well, if at all. Um, Samson's story of success in organizing uh, civil rights activities and creating job opportunities is the success story of civil rights in New Jersey, that out of that 1947 constitution, people can organize and they can sue and they can tear down unjust barriers to fair employment. The problem that emerges after that point, if we focus on Samson, 
is that these long-standing patterns of places that become more and more diverse while places become increasingly less diverse in different parts of the county. Why does that happen if these barriers are falling? Well, the truth is they're not really falling. That when we're creating access to higher income for individual households, it doesn't actually do uh, the work that folks who fought for desegregation hoped for. And that's because the commercial infrastructure, the corporate infrastructure of the region doesn't change. Um, one of my, my dear mentors is a guy named Robert Weems. And he has a beautiful book called Desegregating the Dollar. It's a very small book, but um, powerful. It has a lot of evidence and data that's very useful. And one of the key arguments he makes in Desegregating the Dollar is that when Jackie Robinson entered the major leagues, that that was the end of the Negro League baseball system, that it was only integration for an exceptional employee. None of the managers from the Negro Leagues became managers of major league baseball teams. None of the vendors or ushers who worked Negro League games became vendors or ushers at the major league games. And certainly none of the Negro League team owners became owners, even partial or minor owners of major league baseball teams. It was only integration for the most exceptional potential employees. And so it was breaking down a barrier and creating new opportunity, but it also kept up a very strong set of barriers about wealth and ownership. And in, in union, this is also the case, is that after the civil rights reforms that we see with Samson in the 50s and 60s take hold, there's not any growth of African-American business ownership. In, set, in fact, there's an expansion of large firms held um, by corporations that are dominated, not just by native born kind of Anglo-Saxon or Germanic white families that had been old money from Elizabeth and Lyndon prior to desegregation, but even these new immigrant families that are beginning to blend into um, white society are now also beginning to join the corporations, to climb the corporate ladder, to become managers, to become executives. And so it's a very different story about how wealth is accrued when you get out to Westfield, when you get out to Mountainside, when you get out to Summit. And, and that is not ethnic, it is, it is based on capital accumulation, which was not accessible to new immigrants and to African-Americans after 1970. And that's a lot of the struggle we have to face today, that as we try to find a way to promote equity, justice, equal opportunity for all people, it's that corporate barrier that is the most difficult one. That uh, there's, there's just astonishing numbers nationwide that um, among new immigrants, among uh, African-American populations, African diaspora populations, most businesses are sole proprietorships. That is, they only have the one employee and that one employee owns business. This is not actually a formal, even the LLC is not sufficient. Dr. Friesen, you're freezing up. I, I ask everyone to be patient while we figure this out. Can you all hear me more clearly? Okay, yes. thank you. Um, so that, that particular moment that we saw unfold by 1970 also is not coincidentally the time that we see this wave of massive urban riots, um, over 150 through the mid 1960s culminating with the summer of 1968. That led to a process that the people who lived through it often called disinvestment. Um, another colleague of mine at, at Princeton, Kevin Cruz calls it white flight that the movement out from urban centers like Elizabeth, like Linden, um, was a capital flight, that there were no partnerships forming along the kind of best principles of the society to allow people of all backgrounds to equally benefit from the capital growth 
that happens from the expansion of corporations, from deregulation that occurs in the 1980s. And so that is, is the challenge we have today. And, and we're in this very unusual moment where we've seen three back-to-back -back significant economic contractions in the last 20 years. There was the tech bubble in 2000, 2001. We saw the collapse of the housing bubble in 2007, 2008, and even 2009 through most of the year. And now we've got this moment when we're on the edge of recession due to the pandemic. And we're trying to reimagine how do we rebuild? How do we get over the kind of crisis that we're in and start to rebuild prosperity for not just the current generation, but for generations to come? We keep getting into the cycle of collapse because there are whole segments of the society that are not included. Like it's hard to rebuild and expand the economy in Union County when Rahway as a whole is a drag, where there's such concentrated poverty, um, the issues related to kind of the, the way the uh, penitentiary functions, that can't continue. There has to be a way of actually integrating people who come back out into the way they rebuild their lives. They can't just be isolated socially for the rest of the years that they live. It creates a really huge uh, vacuum that drags away the kind of capital that's created in other parts of the county. And so that's the key. And that's what a lot of my work focuses on is what are the ways that we rebuild counties town by town, county by county and state by state and so we're in this moment where we look at a place like West Virginia, just to kind of widen out the scope for a second, where there's just generational poverty and there is no new capital investment. The major industry being coal is going to die within a generation. There's not going to be new coal jobs in 2070 or 2080. How do you actually bring new industry to that region so that there can be a new level of prosperity for the folks who live in that state? On a smaller scale, it's the same thing we have when we look at a place like Elizabeth. How do we turn around and reinvest in our backyard in ways that grow opportunities for all the people in the region, all the people in the county? And that's where I do a lot of work with financial literacy education. I do a lot of work around getting people to understand macroeconomics better. And that's the thing that our children need in their middle school and high school years, that they're graduating, even though the state requires that we teach something along those lines, typically in their junior or senior year of high school, they're not actually taking that knowledge out or they're not getting knowledge that they can use most effectively when they go back out and begin to get their first jobs or they graduate from college. That I often have students say, they taught me how to write a check. So I can go in and I can figure out who I write it out to, what the amount is, what the date is. I can do all those basic elements but I don't understand what's really happening. Like, I don't know really what a routing number is or how it functions. You know, I'm not sure like how the most basic thing that I'm always astonished the students don't know, um, that you shouldn't rely on one stream of income, that, you know, you don't go out into the world and just say, oh yeah, I have a full-time job and that's gonna give me all the money I ever need. Like they have no idea what it is to even create retirement accounts and try and plan for the future let alone get into an equities market and start to generate more capital out of the actual investments that are available. And so trying to teach them how to be more sophisticated and more savvy. Um, another big lesson, they all think banks are just where they go to put their ATM card in a machine and withdraw money once their di direct deposit hits. And I'm like, no, you should have a relationship with a bank manager or the bank executive who's telling you about new opportunities and can set up lines of credit for you to start new business. It's not just about home ownership. And so those stories aren't happening. Those are the things that we didn't do in the 1970s. Like we kind of restricted that knowledge to people who already had substantial savings, capital, business ownership. And we weren't training younger people coming through middle school, high school and college to then say, I hope I can build a new enterprise one day. I hope I can find a way that I'm doing something that creates value for the people in my area. And so that training is, is kind of the reason why I do talks like this. Um, I want people to start to have that conversation in their households, with their relatives. Uh, um, the biggest single thing I talk about is um, we bombard people with commercial advertisements on how to spend money. 
So um, Amazon alone just floods the internet with different ways and discounts and sales to go out and buy whatever product comes to mind and to not just buy like once a month or once a week, but buy several times a day and get three more boxes put on your step by the time the, the next day comes around. Um, we're really, really good about teaching people to spend money. We're absolutely terrible about teaching people how to kind of not earn money. We're good about getting people jobs, but to actually produce more capital, do things that have value, that it generates systems of revenue for everyone around them. Um, my favorite single story, and this is probably a good way to wrap up because it is a Union County story. Um, a friend of mine that I grew up with um, went off to college, got his degree, went and got his graduate degree and couldn't find a job. And so his first job in um, Philadelphia was working as a manager for Walmart. And he was doing all right and he managed to make ends meet, but he, he wanted to do more. So he got together with some other friends from, from high school and they pulled some money and they wanted to launch an internet startup company. And so the first thing they did was put together a company that sold diapers. And that's all they wanted to do was find cheap diapers that they could sell to people online for low cost. So they wouldn't have to go to the grocery store and buy them. They wouldn't have to go and buy them at a premium in a pharmacy. And this startup, I think they've got off the ground with like $50,000. Inside of two years, it was a company worth over 2 million. They ended up selling it to Amazon for $3 million. So tremendous success, right? Didn't get satisfied, had this opportunity. He then went out and started a larger business. Uh, one that was kind of modeled on the idea of Amazon, but it was a, um, a discount marketer. So there are lots of products that people could dot and buy at a low cost on the new website. So it wasn't just diapers, it was everything. It was televisions, it was lawnmowers, it was just all kinds of products you could buy 30, 40, 50% off. And again, grew rapidly. This is where he brought me back into the pictures. Like, listen, I need more people to sign up for this discount sales website, get as many people as you can. And we spent like a year I think we signed up a little bit over 2 million people to purchase through his website. And then about eight months after we finished the subscription drive, um, they evaluated the company was worth, what is it? $3.3 billion in daily transactions that it was a fast growing model. And so what he took was a $3 million windfall, converted it into a $3 billion windfall and then got a position, uh, the person who bought him out for 3 point billion was Walmart. And now he became an executive at Walmart in charge of all their dis digital transactions, built their worldwide platform for how everybody bought from Walmart online. And now he is the CEO of Walmart, his name is Mark Laurie. And so his approach is really good, but I, frankly, I, I still critique him, I say, this is not necessarily creating the jobs in the backyard that we need to create. Eight. And so that's what I'm hoping I can share with our kids, our grandkids, the kids that are coming up the next generation, that the kind of opportunity they have is greater here in Union County than it is anywhere else in the world. We've already built systems of outstanding opportunity repeatedly over the 20th century, but we need to change our practices and take on some new strategies if we're going to do it in this century. So that's why I was here to talk with y'all tonight. I actually got done a little bit faster than I intended to, but um, I'm looking forward to hearing all of your stories and learning from your examples and hopefully passing on those lessons to other people so we can all see some growth and actually have a better, more stable local community. So we, we have a, pro, a question from Anita about who's working with employers, major corporations to hire and promote diverse employees. So there are thousands of firms that are committed to diversity and equity. Um, I do some of that work, but it, it's, I'm more, I work mostly with nonprofits and with universities. I'll just be frank. Um, you know, I, I do some work with companies, a lot of folks in finance, but um, that is an entire industry by itself. There are people who just forge partnerships with where there are labor pools of folks who are underemployed and then make sure they get the educational and expertise credentials that they need so that they can be hired. But again, it, it's 
small scale. It's not organized on, on a wide enough basis that people can find high paying jobs quickly. I just got a report from JP Morgan about what were the fast, fastest growing jobs for the next 10 years. And schools and universities aren't training people for any of them. And so a lot of the work I'm doing now is talking to middle schools and high schools about getting people better prepared to take on jobs for the future. There's another question about who restricted knowledge about economics, financial literacy in the 1970s and why did that happen? Really good question. And so I'm gonna start with the easy part of it. Um, there's an amazing book about the growth of those problems in New Jersey. It's written by, I believe she's at Harvard. Her name's um, Elizabeth Cohen. Um, it's called A Consumer's Republic. And it goes back to the 1920s and 30s. And it basically lays out um, how we started to rely on consumer spending to build a service economy. Why did it become more important and for people to spend the money they earned than to save it or invest it. And so there's a lot of different sectors that rely on that. The big shift is really in the 70s was the access to credit cards where banks could issue um, a really easy tool for you to access loans so that they, they could then contact you at home and ask you to repay um, on a monthly basis. And now they can do it electronically. Um, they can do it with your mobile phone. And so um, the interest of the financial industry in keeping more people in debt longer was a huge factor in not letting people know how to generate multiple streams of income and pay off debt faster, how to operate across economies of scale. Um, they're, they're not, well, let me say, some lenders are quite malicious. I will say there are a lot of lenders that are not malicious. And so there's just a huge, range of financial actors, institutional financial actors, who individuals as, as consumers have no clue how to interact with effectively. Like the best they can really do is stuff like my dad says, uh, never get into debt, never gonna get into debt, Every, all debt is bad. And you can say that, you know, and it's probably smarter than the option of carrying a lot of debt. But in a world where you have to start a business in order to kind of stay afloat and generate more streams of income, it's a really useful thing to know how to take $100 and then inside of six weeks, turn it into $10,000. Like if you have that skill set, yes, you should borrow and you can pay it back really quickly and you're gonna do really well with that skill. So you can't just approach it like it's 1935 anymore and never ever borrow any debt. Although I will also say college and universities do some extraordinarily bad things in lending extraordinary amounts of money to people who may not be able to pay them back very quickly. So- We are gonna have a program on financial literacy in April. And we're nice. also gonna have a program on the history of the Negro Baseball League on um, this month on February 16th. So I just wanna get that out there. Yes, um, please. Leslie asks, what are those jobs that have the brightest future? All right, all right. So, so we, we have a time to set me up and contact me by email. My fees are quite small. Um, I'm teasing you guys. <laughs> Y'all were looking at me like I was dead serious. <laughs> oh my goodness. So um, what got me um, when I started learning this stuff was back around 1962, there was a federal report that said, okay, if you're gonna make any money in the next generation, 20 to 30 years, go into computers, go into medical care, go into finance. Those are the three areas that they were telling people in 1962. Focus on those and you'll be ahead of the curve and you'll make a lot of money. They didn't circulate that report very widely. <laughs> it, was, it was rare for folks to, to get, get that information. So the JP Morgan report that I just got is uh, talking about a thing called mega trends. So th this is the thing you wanna punch into Google after you get out of this call tonight. You go search for mega trends. It's gonna tell you the six largest areas of economic growth over the next decade. Um, one of them, the, the one at the lowest end is automated factories. So can you actually code an artificial intelligence that will run a factory so you don't need to employ a hundred people or 500 people to manufacture laptops or cell phones or uh, automobiles. So AI and automated factories and the way people 
use software engineering to code them. That's, that's the smallest one. Um, the next larger one from there is actually tied into Elon Musk and SpaceX. Um, you wanna be connected to what they're doing with off-planet harvesting. Um, they're basically taking rare metals from passing meteors and off-planet sources. And there are valuable minerals like gold and platinum and palladium that you can actually harvest from space. And so they're using advanced drones to collect these items, bring them back to earth in a way that you can't get access to the same metals and materials on the planet. So off planet exploration, harvesting using drone space drones is another huge area you can get into. And then the, I'm trying to think the third one they were talking about, the really big one was, uh, oh, um, targeted medicine. So um, using genetic engineering to personalize the way you treat various chronic diseases. And so if you're trying, if you're more oriented to biology and chemistry and pharmaceuticals, um, the kinds of things that we do at pharmacies now are gonna be kind of personalized genetically so that people can, can get real recovery, but it's also a way to kind of make people more dependent on very, very specialized medicines. Can you share what three. you know about Rockfall? It was my understanding this was an area where free slaves first migrated to New Jersey. And also, please share your book. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, Underground Railroad is a great story in New Jersey. And I actually just got some really good news about historic preservation related to the Underground Railroad. Um, I, I wrote an article for the Washington Post, I want to say maybe two or three months ago. And I basically called them out for um, not creating better ways to commemorate places where African Americans had lived historically, and the story of African American history. Um, in, in particular, um, I was doing this because I'm affiliated with a group called the T. Thomas Fortune Foundation, and um, there's a national landmark in Red Bank that we were able to restore, even though it was it was on the brink of collapsing and being lost. And so now it's a community center and I, everybody's invited, come down as soon as you had the chance, we we're able to get out from under COVID. Um, but there's so many good, good front programs there. But preserving the Underground Railroad in New Jersey is a challenge our state can meet with really, really almost no cost. And so places like Vauxhall, these, these are the places where people were able to kind of get from Maryland, get from Delaware and actually escape to New York, escape to Canada. And um, there are so many really amazing stories down in, in like Fairlawn as another underground railroad destination, um, really across Burlington County and across uh, a lot of this kind of um, southwestern corridor across Union County up towards Newark. Um, we're at the heart of a major artery of the underground railroad. And so African-American history is really powerful here. Um, the six books, let me just do it like this, because I'm going to put my, my web address in the um, chat. My first two books are explicitly on New Jersey history. It's uh, The Path to Freedom, Black Families in New Jersey. That came out in 2010. And then um, Suburban Erasure came out in 2013. It was um, best nonfiction book in New Jersey studies back in 2014. Um, that's the one I used to talk about the patterns that I was talking about tonight. But the two titles are The Path to Freedom in 2010 and uh, Suburban Erasure that came out in 2013. Dr. Grease, can I send a follow-up email to everyone and I can list your books in that email? Thank you so much. Um, um, so the last four, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I was just going to say the last four books are all kind of bigger economic histories where I study how the economy's changed. And so like the last, I don't know, 10 minutes of what I was talking about and the types of things I teach are all in those books. I'll put those four titles in. It's uh, American Economy, uh, Industrial Segregation, Planning Future Cities, and Cities Imagined. And you have a book on Black Thomas. Yeah, the Cities Imagined book, the last chapter, um, 
I did a lot of work um, designing the idea of Wakanda from 2003 to 2016. And so um, the filmmakers ended up using that for the Black Panther film. And so um, the work that I put into the idea of Wakanda and how it evolves is all in the fourth chapter of Cities Imagined. So we have another question. Does Brookside Heights have any significance in Union, New Jersey? Brookside Heights is Curryville. Just a question after that. Yeah, no, I'm pretty new. So if folks know these places, like I'd, I'd love to get more info about them. I'm, I'm just kind of uncovering a lot of the things that, that weren't covered by, by Mattingly and Segru. Um, um, so, hi, I don't know if we're allowed to talk. Are we allowed yeah. to share? Yeah. Hi, hi, uh, Dr. Griezmann, is a doctor? Um, yes, but you can call has, me Walt. You can call me uh, Walt. It has been an, it's been amazing to listen to. Um, I'm really glad I joined this. I really enjoyed the conversation. I have a, a podcast, which is for suburban moms. Great. And it's under the umbrella of my brand, which is called Blacks in the Burb. So I have done quite a few different like documentary style short clips of different areas in the suburbs where African-Americans were. And Curryville was one that I did a 10 minute like little web story about where mm. I talked to like children who grew up in Curryville. Um, it became named, it, it's the, it was named Curryville after they had taken down the apple orchard there and built up mm. about a hundred homes for African-American families. Um, and the first families to move there, their last name was Curry. Uh -huh. So that's why Brookside Heights became Curryville. My, my husband was one of the people who grew up in Curryville. Yes, yeah, cool. um, I'd love to talk with you more. This sounds amazing. Yeah, I would love to talk to you. I would love to have you on my podcast too. So I'm sorry, this is a shameless plug, but <laughs> I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm really glad I will be on the one about the Negro Baseball League. And please keep doing this Union Library. This was wonderful. Thank you, Thank you mm -hmm. very much. So, so now I have a question. My own question is, how is Union County unique? Oh, how is Union County unique? It, it is. From your focus, from your hot. perspective. Yeah, the, the melting pot piece that, you know, at that point when the Constitution changed and the way um, the, the county really expanded westward, that, that's a very unusual story. And so the specifics of how suburbs expanded out in the middle of the 20th century um, is different from any other part of the state, um, even in being related to both Middlesex and uh, Somerset counties in some ways that I do talk a lot more about. But it, it's proximity, having larger urban centers in the east and then kind of really more affluent, smaller, well, not smaller. Um, it's not suburbs, it's just really kind of exclusive enclaves um, in the western portion of the county. It, it's, it's geography is different, it's social geography is different. And it basically shows a way that people can try to begin to desegregate and integrate more effectively, but um, it doesn't happen in very many places. And so that's why I'm really hopeful to learn more about union is that there's a chance to kind of allow for more opportunity, more ways of people to have cross-cultural contact that is often difficult in other, other locations. So I'm gonna try an experiment and unmute everybody um, so that if you have a question. Hello. So, Johnny Rosser had his hand up. Yeah. Johnny? Yes. Um, doctor, well, let me get back. I had a question that relates to um, in, in Union, uh, they put an in interstate um, 70, interstate 78. But uh, my understanding is that many of the interstate highway systems uh, that were put together across the country, a lot of those had uh, impact on uh, splitting various communities. It, for 78, which ultimately split Vauxhall from, from Union, but this happened in, in other areas, uh, Meacham Park, Missouri, and a few other cities uh, where you had the same kind of thing. I was just wondering if you want to comment on any of that? Oh yeah, no, that's a very, very frequent topic of discussion for urban historians. The, uh, the colloquial way that folks talk about it is, uh, is uh, urban renewal, which is highway construction, is Negro removal. And so that, that feature happened thousands and thousands of times 
Um, mm -hmm. The way cities change, I mean, it's horrific. It's horrific when you look at the way people are displaced and, and taken advantage of because they're con considered to have no worth by the planners and the people who are trying to see the way they, they can do economic development. Mm -hmm. That situation did actually occur here in Union uh, between the Vauxhall community and, and Union, which pretty much split, split uh, that right in half. Yeah, no, there's going to be a big, big record trail for that. So if I could partner with somebody at Rutgers, especially, they, they could do an extraordinary paper on that. Um, Dunham, North Carolina was one of those removal cities. Um, and what is the most diverse township in Union County? Do you have any insight into why that is the most diverse township? Mm. That's Nicole. Most diverse, it really depends on how you define it, because there are four or five that either don't have an ethnic majority or are like they have several large kind of ethnic groups that are, are split relatively evenly. Um, and that's part of the reason why I think it's fascinating is that that level of, of um, it's not dispersion, but evenly kind of distributed ethnic groups. Um, I was looking at Plainfield and then um, Hillside, I think Union. They're all, they have this sense of being kind of upper working class to middle class and, and they're doing better than, than the places I mentioned like Rahway and, and Linden and Elizabeth. And so, you know, they, they give us blueprints for having more, more equitable access. I'm sorry, was somebody else was trying to jump in. Anyone else have a question? That's Nicole, did yeah. I answer that question? Uh, I, yeah, I hope Nicole, are you set with that? I think she is. I'm going to okay. say she is. Um, can you talk about the GI Bill in Union County? Um, more drone, like that shows up a lot in um, Elizabeth Cohen's book. Um, her take on, on the GI Bill is, is it, hmm. People can characterize it as mostly benefiting um, white and white ethnic GIs coming back from the Second World War. And, and that was true to an extent, but actually in New Jersey, because of the anti-discrimination protections, you do have African-American and, and Latinx families who also benefit from GI Bill through the early 1950s. And so um, it's not equitable. There's still patterns of segregation that persist where there are only certain kinds of lending in certain kinds of areas. It's not breaking down the kind of residential barriers I was, I was discussing, but the GI Bill was enormous. Um, in terms of access to higher paying jobs for a group of people who may not have much more than an eighth grade education at the time they, they got out of the conflict. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Um, that the GI Bill made it possible for a young man age 23, 25, 27 to make enough money with a technical education to support a household of five on a, on a single income. And so the GI Bill just, just invented the idea of uh, a, a stable single family household, the idea that a middle-class American family could live like Leave it to Beaver, like that <laughs> mythology of, you know, the, the working dad, the stay-at-home mom and multiple kids going to school uh, that was a direct product of the GI Bill and, and the idea of it in a place like Union County that suburbanizes really rapidly, that's, that's the lifestyle that many of the folks moving to the county between uh, 1945 and 1965, that's, that's what they hope to achieve. That's, that's what they wanted. Okay. I, I, I'm going to do a last round for questions and, and I've unmuted, I've, I've said everybody can unmute themselves. So I'm going to do one more call for questions, then I'm going to sum up. And which is basically thank you. And then I'm going to turn off the recording. So um, one more call for questions. I'll do the sum up. And if you have a question, you can ask it right afterwards. So the sum up is, oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just had one quick question was that, um, and, and it might not be very quick, but what would be your vision in terms of what the suburbs will look like, specifically Union County over the next five to 10 years, considering everything that's happened with COVID and real estate and people moving more into the suburbs, um, what, what do you think is, how do you think the landscape is gonna change 
population wise? Yeah, no, I, we had this, we've had those, those three economic contractions basically back to back to back. And then we had a dramatic reduction in immigration, which was driving a lot of the way kind of uh, community change was unfolding. So now it's mostly the um, local uh, birth rate that's going to say, okay, over the next decade or two, do the children of the families who have grown up here in the last 10 or 20 years choose to come back and reside here? And unless we have more growth in kind of the, the large scale employers in the area, that, that's probably unlikely. And so I, I would bet on some contraction of the population. And in fact, in those um, older communities um, along the Eastern region, um, you're gonna see a lot of the state and social services stuff contract. And that is going to enable some kinds of revitalization for people who move back. There'll be more affordable places in Elizabeth and Linden, and then they can essentially gentrify. Uh, they can become places that younger people want to meet and start their from early years of their first families. And it, it will somewhat repeat the cycle, but you're going to have other communities. I would bet probably Cranford is, is kind of vulnerable for this, um, that their social services are going to really struggle. They're going to lose population. Um, they're not going to be able to kind of have the same kind of standard of living they had maybe 20 years ago. And so you'll, you'll get maybe four or five places across Union County that have been pretty comfortable, that it felt really good, but not necessarily elite um, that will contract and, and become more working class and, and the, the housing stock will age, not, not necessarily be repaired or rebuilt at, you know, in a way that people will find desirable in 2030 or 2040. That's my guest today, you know, reading tea leaves. Um, Alma Wilkins says, I'm in Sunnyside in Linden and I see an influx of Latino Jews moving into the community. Alma, did you have a question? You can unmute yourself. I tried to unmute you, but you can unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a huge part of like when I'm in Long Branch, I mean, Ocean has had a, a very significant migration of Syrian Jews that are transforming the area. They're quite, quite affluent. Uh, down in Lakewood is where the spot where people get really bent out of shape about Jewish in migration and, you know, the way Jew and Jewish families build institutions. But I mean, folks are allowed to build communities <laughs> where they're around the people that, that they worship with. And that's a huge part of what it means to be American is, is you know, you have church, you have synagogue, you have temple with people, and you, know, you like to live and work together. That's kind of part of the way the society works. I have a question. Hey. Hi, how are you? Uh, a million years ago, I, I went to school with this guy named Richard Florida, who writes about cities. Yeah. And he talks about the arts in culture, you know, leading a renaissance. So when you look at places like Hoboken and maybe now Jersey City, I mean, is there a chance for places that are like middle class to, you know, mine the arts like this in a revival? Or are they too family centered? I don't know. No, no. When you see areas that, that start to struggle and, and you see fa older families, uh, kind of empty nest families that begin to downsize and then look for smaller properties, like that's a key moment to intervene there and start to promote folks who are, you know, artists who are, you know, single engineers, young professionals to come in and kind of start their lives in, in a similar way. And there's a lot of, uh, Eatontown is doing this. Um, Jared Kushner's actually got a really big, big redevelopment project in Eatontown uh, tied to um, part of the revitalization of Fort Monmouth is happening with that. But there was another one that was in mind. Um, Heightstown out, out along um, Route 1 is doing a lot of this as well. And it's, um, it's talking about the creative class. Richard Florida is, is probably the most prominent um, popular urbanist. He's, he's constantly consulted about redevelopment everywhere. And it's that, that insight has been really helpful, but it's not universally applicable. So it's worked really well in Pittsburgh, hasn't worked as well in Detroit. And so it, it 
kind of has some factors that are more subtle than just saying having young creative people come in. You, you want to actually have the local government give them some kinds of um, basic incentives. Um, tax amnesty for short periods of time can work. Um, there are ways you can basically encourage young people to move in um, and then build new enterprise that actually starts uh, like mini Silicon Valley is one example. But um, the whole kind of uh, Midwest, Northeast, we, we've got to kind of rework the way our states and municipalities work to reward people who take those kinds of risks. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you happen to mention something uh, in terms of gentrification, but my question now would be, what is happening in terms of the gentrification within the uh, a lot of the urban areas? For example, Elizabeth, I know, is going through that, East Orange, et cetera. So would you comment on uh, the aspect of gentrification on the, uh, on the urban environment, of which some of Union County has some of those going on? Yes, that's the, the essence of the problem I, I try to study is that there are economies of scale that someone who can barely afford paying rent on a $100,000 lot um, if someone were to come along and say, well, I'm going to give you $300,000, give everybody on the block, 10 of them, $300,000 a piece to clear out, everybody's going to jump at that. They're like, I'm struggling to pay $100,000. This person is going to give me 300. dollars Yes, I'm out of here. Then that person just put out $3 million, but they tear down the block and they reorganize it as a luxury apartment complex where they have people buying or, or actually leasing each unit for $500,000 and there are 20 units. Like just because they had the upfront capital to do the redevelopment, they end up making $7 million a year. And so like <laughs> this, this is the economy of scale is that the, the initial buyer has no ability to resist the process of gentrification. And so if you're going to try and disrupt that you can limit where real estate developers can do that kind of flipping, or you can give some kind of local assistance so that it lets the homeowner at $100,000 hold their property without an increasing tax burden. And so it's, it's all public policy. It's all just choosing what kind of outcomes we want to see. But right now, we favor someone who has large amounts of capital who wants to redevelop or gentrify an area. And not only do they get the benefits from the state, they get to reap massive <laughs> profit and go on and continue doing it. So I just want to thank Dr. Gleason and everybody. First of all, thank everybody who's here online for participating tonight. Um, we would not be doing this without you. So please um, take a bow and thank you very much. Again, I encourage you to follow us on Facebook. Look at our website, www.utlnj.org, um, and sign up for our newsletter. So next week, we have a program on gaming and Sinatra, two different programs, one on gaming and one on Frank Sinatra. The week after that, we have History of Negro Baseball League. Um, we, and then we have a program on um, tax help for the unemployed. So we have lots of programs. So um, please take a look at us. In the meantime, Dr. Gleason, we, when we say we couldn't have done it without you, you're number one on that category. And I really want to thank you for participating tonight. So thank Wonderful you for having us. Stay offer. safe. <laughs> Great. Okay, I've now uh, stopped stop the video. If anyone wants to talk, feel free. But we have gone over. I don't want to take up time.